I hope by now, as you've been attending the seminar, that this has encouraged you to really begin to uh, really get in and dig in the Word of God. Amen? Amen. I tell you, these, uh, these seminars are designed to help you to understand the Bible, to help you grow in your Christian life, and specifically uh, to understand Bible prophecy, which we're going to get into in a, in a, in a major way uh, during these next few uh, evenings, especially coming up this next weekend. You know, people have, for years and years, have tried to, tried to figure out how they can live longer and really how they can live forever. This has been the hope of mankind throughout the ages. They have tried to figure out how they can give, uh, get eternal life or extend their life for a long, long period of time. People have traveled the world over to... Uh, to find magic potions to various places. Isn't this a beautiful spot? I shot this with my camera. It's over there in uh, Australia, just uh, north of Sydney, Australia. A little place called uh, Avondale College right behind there. It's a beautiful spot. You've traveled all over trying to get magic potions, all of these things. Uh, years and years ago, before I was even coming to, I just came to Florida on vacation. My wife and I used to vacation here. Started in 1973, so it's 45 years. We've, we've lived in, we've vacationed in every place in Florida, from one end to the other, all, over, all the way around it. So one day, we, one time we were down here in Florida, and I thought, you know, I talk about how to live forever. Uh, we were about two or three hours away from this uh, place, uh, uh, the Fountain of Youth. I thought, let's swing over there. I said, I want to get my, I want to go over there and see what it's like. Maybe I can get a picture there and I can put it in my meetings. So I went over to the Fountain of Youth. And there, I saw this great, this great fountain. It was found by Ponce de Leon, the Spanish explorer. And this is, this is what the Fountain of Youth have, has looks like. If, have any of you been there? Probably some of you have been over there, right? Yeah, so I thought, well, you know, I'm going to drink some of this water and see what, what it does for me. Like I told you last night, I'm going to show you what happened when I drank of this water. Hopefully, here we are. Well, what your conclusion should be, it doesn't work. <laughs> That's, this is my conclusion. This is when I drank of it. It's probably in the late 70s or early 80s, and evidently it didn't help me because uh, I have continued to age. You know what? I've picked up a fortune cookie one time. It says, age is mostly a matter of mind. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. <laughs> oh, yes. The older we get, the more we have uh, certain things we look forward to the coming of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Because, you know, you want to have, you want to live health, healthfully and live longer. But sometimes the body begins to go a little bit. You know, people have tried to appease the gods and to have eternal life through various methods. This man is from India. Of course, he's walking across a bed of hot coals. Uh, that's not, uh, uh, you know, that, and, and it's not, he walks barefooted. So this is part of his thing to, in order to appease the gods and have, have favor and maybe get that gift of eternal life. Here's another place. This is from the Philippines. They do this uh, every year. They run these, uh, I guess you could say, kind of... Uh, shafts of the needles into their back large needles and you can see what they do there and they march up and down the streets uh, in order to gain favor with the gods and to uh, maybe have uh, some way of earning eternal life i had the privilege of i've had the privilege of really traveling all over the world i was in bangkok thailand when i was in vietnam i went over transferred over to thailand we went into bangkok and i was uh, struck by the beauty of the city of bangkok thailand but as i but uh, as i went around i saw all these beautiful buddhist temples there and, and, you know, it's a quite, a quite a nice place. But I was struck by the, the you know, the beauty of these temples. And they, the, the Buddhists, of course, will give, uh, they give uh, gifts to the, the Buddhist priests going up and down the street because they think that by doing this, they will gain favor with God and, and maybe to uh, uh, ex have this eternal life. But how can we have eternal? Here's another guy. He thought he would, this is another one where they want to mortify the body. This is a guy who's laying uh, in a bed of, I guess you could call a bed of thorns. Many religious uh, codes have advocated the mortifying of the flesh. Christianity has done this too in church history. And it's resulting subjection to the spirit. Marriage, speech, and cleanliness are often among the popular renunciations. In this photograph, we have an example of self-suppression. Some others think that by bowing toward Mecca three times a day, 
you can get favor with God and thereby you gain eternal life. Others, even in the United States, think, well, you put more money in the offering plate, you may gain favor with God and get eternal life. There's others who've gone the medical way by uh, certain drugs and other things they think they're going to be able to extend their life. There is one thing called cryogenics. Have you ever heard of this? This is where you have your body frozen when you die. And I, my dad uh, had a friend of his who had his body frozen, paid to have it done. And, and, you know, they'll come up with some kind of a cure. They'll rejuvenate you. And then you can come back and, and live forever. But what is the man? You know, the, the, the advent of sulfur drugs and the other drugs have given us longer life on this earth. There's no question about this. But when we're born, we know that we have a finite amount of time on this earth. We're born young and healthy generally, but then the time takes its toll and then we come to the end of our life. Because the Bible says the wages of sin is what? Yes. Death. Now, Jesus spoke of death as a sleep, but the Bible says that wages of sin is death, that death, death that's going to be end everything for everyone who doesn't accept Jesus. In Genesis, this is not the way God had created things. In the beginning, I'm going to talk a little, quite a bit about this next Friday evening, but in the beginning, God created Adam and Eve, and they had the ability to live forever until Eve took of the forbidden fruit, which we talked about last night. She had the ability, and Adam had the ability to continue living forever, but once they disobeyed God, they were cast out of that uh, Garden of Eden, cast away from the Tree of Life, and they lost their eternal life. Romans 5 12 tells us these words, therefore just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin and in this way death came to all people because all what? Sin. sin. Romans 5 I call it the one man chapter. Death came in by one man and salvation came in by one man. Romans 3 23 it says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How many? All, everybody, every single person has sinned. We've all sinned. Now, you take example. You know, the Bible says that even by a wrong thought, we sin. So, if you uh, only did three sins a day, and you multiply, multiply that by, you know, 365 days a year, that's a thousand sins a year. And say some of you are 50 years old, you have committed 50,000 sins. That's only three sins. By even a wrong thought, you sin. You can sin. So, I mean, that's not many. Three a day. If you went down here to the Brooksville Courthouse and you found a lawyer and said, well, I got a little problem. What's your problem? He'd say, well, I've committed 50,000 crimes. <laughs> what do you think he would tell you? Well, he'd say, bring on the money, probably. <laughs> but generally, they would say, no, your case is hopeless. My friends, we've all sinned and come short of God's glory. And we have so many sins, there's no way we can atone, atone for our sins. There is none righteous, no, not one. Now, every once in a while, I have found somebody who believes they have not sinned. Most of them are kind of crazy. But one time, well, I mean, I'm just telling you the truth. I always make it, Pastor, I always make things direct so people know what I'm saying. But... One time I was uh, in a little town uh, south of Fort Wayne, Indiana. I was beginning my ministry. We did a seminar there, and the lady attended our seminar. I talked about all of sin. And you know what she said? She said, I don't think I've sinned. Only she wasn't, you know, she wasn't like the normal person that was kind of loony. You know, she, she just believed it. And, I, and I, so I sat down and talked with her a little bit. She was a mother, young mother, about maybe 26, 27 years old. She had four children. She was a very mild temperament person. She didn't get angry at people. She didn't get angry at her children. She was uh, a very placid, nice person. And she wasn't among where a lot of people do a lot of sins very quickly. She probably didn't do as many sins. But finally, even she had to admit, even with her mild temperament, mild lifestyle, kind of a Christian-oriented uh, uh, family history, she had sinned because the Bible says no matter who we are on this earth, we've all sinned. Amen? Amen. The wages of sin is what? Amen. Death. So what you get for all you've done is death. Wages. Well, what are wages? Well, wages are what you earn. Say, for instance, you've uh, been working hard in your job. You worked 50 hours. You put in overtime. It was a bad week. 
And when you got to the end of the week, the boss came and gave you a check and said, well, here's a gift for you. But he gave you the check that was your wages for what you had done for the week. What would you say when the boss gave you the gift or the, the check? What would you say? <laughs> you wouldn't say thank you. You earned it, right? You know, a gift is something you get without earning it. You know, we earn what is the wages of what we do on this earth. Well, Romans 4.4 4 tells us, Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. When we work, we get our wages. And everything we've done on this earth, the sum total of all of our works are our wages, and that earns us death. Now, matter, we could live perfectly from this point forward, and we still would not have eternal life. There was an individual that was committed murder, manslaughter, was thrown in prison, going to be there for 20 years. And finally, he became convicted that he has done the wrong thing. And so he decided he's going to live a perfect life. So for one year in the prison, he did not do anything wrong. He did not break any rules. He was a model prisoner. He did everything perfect in that prison. After that year, he said, I want to speak to the warden. So they took him down, the warden, and the warden, he said to the warden, he said, well, you know, I want to go home. The warden says, well, why do you want to go home? He says, well, you know that during the last year, I've not done one single thing wrong, and now I want to go home because I, I'm no longer doing these things that I used to do. The warden said, well, you know, you have been a model prisoner. You couldn't have done better this entire year, but you cannot go home unless someone pardons you from what you've done in the past. Amen? Amen. You could live perfectly from this day forward, and you still have all those sins that have happened in the past. The great reformer Martin Luther, we're celebrating the 500 years of Martin Luther's a life. I've had a privilege of going to uh, Germany and uh, uh, touring these areas and been in his church, stood in his church. Pre uh, had, we had services in that church. And he was a Roman Catholic priest. He used to do things to mortify his flesh. He would do penances. He would beat himself with a whip. He would stand out in the cold. He would go up and down stairs on his knees, kissing each step. He'd do all of these things, trying to gain favor with God to atone for his sins. He'd be out in the cold rain and he could not feel better about what had happened because you cannot atone for your own sins. Can a person save himself? This guy here, uh, uh, he's sitting on a bed of nails with his dutiful family sitting over there. Isn't that amazing? Thinking he's going to get favor with God. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may you also do good that are accustomed to doing evil. That's a rhetorical question. We cannot do good if we're accustomed to doing evil. This is what the Bible says. What happened? Martin Luther, reading the Bible, found the book of Romans, and he, re he read this passage, The just shall live by faith. Amen. My friends, the only way that we can be saved is through faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says, For by grace are you saved through what? Faith. faith. And not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The only way that we can be saved and have eternal life is through faith. The 19th century, uh, or 20, yeah, 19th and 20th, early 20th century preacher, Dwight L. Moody, uh, was invited to preach one time in a large prison. He had given a powerful sermon in the prison. A lot of the prisoners were there. And, and when he got ready to uh, uh, leave, he said, well, he asked the uh, warden, can I visit a few people, a few, few of the prisoners? And so he began to go down the cells. He came to the first cell, and uh, the warden and Moody, and, and Moody looked in at the young man that was in there, and he said, uh, oh, why are you here? He says, well, I didn't do anything wrong, Mr. Moody. I, I shouldn't be here. He said, the police had it in for me. They framed me. I didn't do anything wrong, and I should not be in this prison. I didn't do anything wrong. So he said, okay. So he went down to the next person. He says, well, what are you in here for? He says, well, I'm in here for this, but I didn't do anything wrong. He said, they put me in for embezzlement, but it was my partner who did it. They framed me. I didn't do anything wrong, and I should not be locked up in this prison because I did not commit a crime. He went down to the next place, the next cell. 
And he said, what are you in here for, son? He said, well, I, Mr. Moody, he said, I didn't do anything wrong. He said, my wife had a lover on the side. They made it look like I committed a crime. I never did a single thing wrong. I should not be locked up in this prison. Moody turned around and looked at the warden and said, I've never seen so many righteous people in all my life. <laughs> finally, he goes down a little bit. And finally, he looks in. He sees a guy with his head kind of bent over, kind of, you know, kind of his head is kind of down a little bit. And, and he looked at, like he was weeping a little bit. And Moody stopped the warden and he said, let me speak to this man. He said, uh, son, why are you in here? He said, oh, Mr. Moody. He said, I committed some terrible crimes. He said, I've committed crimes against God and my fellow man. And I don't think God can forgive me. And I, I, don't, I have no hope for the future. And Moody said, turned to the warden, and he said, I finally found an honest man in this prison. And so he would you mind unlocking the door? And the warden had the, the, the cell supervisor unlock the door. And Moody went in and shared with this man from the Bible, this young man, how that we are saved by grace through faith. And he asked that young man to kneel down and pray with him. And the young man knelt down and God, he asked God to forgive his sins and asked Jesus to come into his heart. And my friends, right there on that spot, that young man had his sins forgiven and got the gift of eternal life. Amen? Amen. We have to, first thing we have to do in order to have eternal life is to realize there is absolutely nothing you can do to gain eternal life. You understand this? This is a key, key concept. Here is it, what the Bible says. All of us are prisoners, whether, no, this is my comment here. All of us are prisoners, whether we want to admit it or not. We are prisoners in this world of sin and suffering. We are waiting for the day when Jesus opens a prison door of mortality and gives us his pardon and true freedom, which is immortality when he comes. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That is how our first step in having eternal life. Isaiah 64, 6, it says, all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. This doesn't say all our sins are like filthy rags. It says all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We are in a total lost condition. By the way, do you know what a filthy rag is? I'm going to tell you what a felt. When I went to the sem when I uh, quit my job at General Motors and went to the seminary, my two children were little. One was about four years old and one was about a uh, year and a half old. My wife worked in a laboratory the hospital, and so I took care of the children a lot in the evenings. And I know what a filthy rag is. A filthy rag is one you pick up with two fingers, hold it far away from you, and get it to the wastebasket where it's sealed as fast as you can. You know what I'm talking about here, folks. This is what the Bible is talking about. All our righteous acts are as filthy rags in the eyes of God. Paul, who was converted on the road to Damascus, said these words. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Paul the, you wrote more in the New Testament than anybody else, one of the, the great apostles who really was a great missionary of the church, said of, him own, of his own self, he said, I'm the chief of sinners. If Paul says he's the chief of sinners, where does that put you and I? Okay. For God so loved the world. Let's solve this problem now. We're all sinners. Amen? Amen? We got that point. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I tell you, I don't think, uh, I think I'm still getting an understanding of this text all, all my life. But when I first got the real good understanding of it was when I was uh, just getting ready to go to Vietnam. My 
uh, I, at that time, I was, uh, had, was married, of course, I had my oldest son, and it was going to be tough to leave. You know, this is tough when you got to leave. Pa uh, our pastor spoke about uh, being leaving his family for a month. Leave your family and go to the combat zone, where there is a good uh, likelihood you may not come back. When your next door neighbor didn't come back, when your classmates didn't come back, you, I mean, these are, these are, well, this was not ethereal. But my, I remember we were going to leave that morning. Now, my dad was a, a very strong, you know, strong person physically. Uh, we, were, we had a farm there in Missouri. He was a, quite muscular. Him and, his, my, him and my uh, uncles, they were, there was like seven brothers, and they liked to spar with one another. Very muscular. I took more after my mother in the muscular part. But he was quite strong. And they used to get broom handles, old broom handles, and they would hold on to them and twist them in two or unless they tore the, the, tore the uh, calluses off their hands. They were, they were quite competitive, too. But my dad was a very stoic man. He was in the World War II in the Battle of the Bulge, where you know, his, his particular company was uh, ambushed. He was one of eight who walked out. Everybody else was killed or couldn't walk. So he, he knew what the combat was. So my dad was very, never saw my dad cry. Never, you know, never was a very emotional person, not any hugging all this stuff. But that day when I got ready to leave to go to Vietnam, uh, my, my little boy needed some food, so we thought we'll shoot into town, get the food, and then I'll come back and we'll go to the, head up to the airport. So when uh, I came back, here's my mother crying. I said, what's wrong? <laughs> kind of a dumb question, really, in retrospect. But when you're young, you don't know these things. I said, what's wrong? Well, dad's out in the barn crying. He thought you'd left without saying goodbye. And there came my dad back. Came out, put his arms around me. I mean, this happened 50 years ago. Still brings tears to my eyes. My dad said, I wish I could go in your place. I wish I could go in your place. That helped me to begin to understand what the love of God is like. Amen? Amen? God loved us so much. He gave His Son so that we could have eternal life. Amen. Would you give your Son for anybody? I wouldn't. I might give myself for somebody, but I'd never give my Son. My friends, the Bible says this, that Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, Calvary so that we could have eternal life. Jesus God loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son so we could have eternal life. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. The Lord is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, wit, wit, wickedness and rebellion and sin. My, my friends, God loves us with an everlasting love. Amen? All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. And the word iniquity is sin. God laid the sins of all of us on Jesus so that we could have eternal life. Romans 5, 8, it says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still, what? Sinners, Christ died for us. What a deal. We don't find that in any religion in the entire world. I love this quotation from The Desire of Ages, one of the books that you'll get up here. Christ was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as he deserved. He was condemned for our sins, in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness, in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his. My friends, what a deal. Romans 5, 19, for just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. We get made righteous through what Jesus did for us. Amen? God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it can't get any better than that. How then can you be saved? Isn't this a beautiful spot? I've showed you a few places. We, we were uh, in, 
a place called Hot Springs, Arkansas. Have you ever heard of it? Yeah. There's a lake, I forgot, Lake Hamilton, I think it was called. We got over there, we didn't know where we were going to stay, and they couldn't find us a place, and finally they found us a place. A physician had a little vacation home there, and that was the view out our back window. That was pretty nice. <laughs> nice little condo. It was, it was good to stay there every day. How can you be saved? Well, the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, the, the salvation is a gift from God. Amen? Amen? You have to, it's a gift. Now, I've got a gift for somebody tonight. Here is a $10 bill I'm going to give to the first person who comes up here. Who wants it? Boo! Well, there's our first, okay. He just got 10 bucks. Amen? It, any of you could have had it. Some of you in the back would have really had to move. <laughs> but when did the gift become his? When he took it. Eternal life is a gift, but you've got to accept it. You've got to take it. Paul and Silas were thrown in prison for preaching the gospel. God intervened for them and took them out of uh, their chains. There was a great earthquake, and the, the jailer thought uh, they were all gone. He was going to kill himself. And, and Paul said, well, hey, don't do it. Don't do yourself any harm. We're still here. And, uh, and the, he came in and fell down before them. He says, what must I do uh, to be saved? And Paul says to him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. We've got to believe on Jesus. Amen? That just doesn't believe, believe that Jesus existed. Because the Bible says in James 2.19, the devils believe and tremble. So what does it mean to believe in Jesus? Well, I'm going to tell you a little story. This picture was taken over Niagara Falls. This was a, like 1910, I believe it was. And here's another one from 1938, you know, when the falls were uh, completely frozen over. Uh, this is one from a few years ago, Niagara Falls frozen over. It doesn't happen very often. It, it may have be happening this year, I don't know. But, you know, it's, it's amazing. But there was a man many years ago by the name of Blondine. He, he was born 1824, and he used to walk tightropes. He became famous really worldwide. He was born in France and then uh, did most of his uh, uh, performances in uh, England and America. But he was a tightrope walker. And he stretched a tightrope uh, tight across Niagara uh, Falls right there uh, by, on the Niagara River. And as he began to uh, uh, get more famous, there was as many as 100,000 people came out in the 1860s to watch Blondine walk a tightrope across Niagara Falls. One of those individuals was a university professor. And he was quite enamored with Blondine. And Blondine also uh, was doing all kinds of various feats. First, uh, he, he walked out there. And then he took a cane out there or one of these balance bars out there. Many different things. And the professor began to watch him. And he began to say, well, you know, there's, you're so good at this. I believe that you, you know, you could take a chair and take it out, on my, uh, out there on that, that that uh, my Niagara Falls on that tightrope and Blondine took a chair out there and he, he actually sat on that chair and kept one foot balanced but he kind of sat on that chair and, and you know there was larger and larger crowds attending all the time and the newspapers were uh, of course uh, uh, writing about him and it was just quite a, a novelty and of course probably people paid to see Blondine do this great feat finally this uh, professor said to him you know you're so good at this you could actually probably take a bicycle and take it out on Niagara Falls. You know, you could wheel it out, wheel it back, it would be no problem. And I guess they've got Blondine probably practice in his backyard. I don't know how they would develop these things, but he was so good at it, so well known that he did. He took a bicycle out there. And you know, it's windy. Have any of you been to Niagara Falls? Yes? You know, it's windy up in there. The falls themselves make a lot of wind. It's, and the mist is flying all over the place, so it's not, not simple. But he did this, and people were watching him, and, and it was phenomenal. Finally, this university professor told him, he said, you know, you are so good at this. He says, I think you can take a wheelbarrow out on Niagara Falls. You know, the wheelbarrow with only one wheel. You know what I'm talking about? Not these ones I got now that have two wheels, but just one wheel. And you know how hard it is to balance one of those just regularly. But Blondine said, okay, I'm going to do it. So he practiced, I guess. And then finally the day came when there's newspaper photographers, all of these people out here to watch Blondine with this great uh, thing that he was doing. And so he took the wheelbarrow out there on Niagara Falls. And, you know, the wind was blowing and it was dangerous. But he made it all the way back. 
out all the way back and everybody was cheering. This professor, university professor, came up to him and said, you know, you are the greatest tightrope walker that has ever lived in the history of this world. He says, you are so phenomenal. He said, I, there's nothing that you can't do. He says, you're so good, I believe you could take a man in that wheelbarrow and take him out on Niagara Falls on that tightrope. And Blondie said, you're, I think you're right, get in. <laughs> and that professor was never seen around there again. Did he believe it? No. If he had believed it, he would have got in. By the way, history records that Blondine did carry his manager on his shoulders out on Niagara Falls. So his manager believed in him, didn't he? But you know, if you believe, you would do it. He would have got into that wheelbarrow. And believing in Jesus is more than just believing that Jesus lived and died. It is a childlike faith. It's taking the leap of faith and following Jesus all the way. It's reaching out by faith and grabbing hold of Jesus Christ. What are the steps to peace of mind? Here's the steps to peace of mind to have eternal life. First, accept. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal, eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. We must accept Jesus Christ. Secondly, believe. We have to believe. We talked about this already. You know, you have to believe more than Jesus lived and died. You have to believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior. You have to ask Him to come into your life and to take over your life and your heart. Thirdly, you have to confess your sins. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. All our sins can be forgiven if we confess our sins. And finally, uh, not finally, but we must repent. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. What does it mean to repent? Let me tell you a little story. In the eastern U.S., in the northeastern U.S., there was a lady who lived in a nice two-story home. She was uh, uh, in her late 30s, and she had a 12-year-old had a daughter, 13-year-old daughter, and a young child about a year and a half old, a little bit of distance between the two girls. And so this lady was, uh, had a nice suburban home, good life. And she was uh, one day trying to fix some cakes and stuff. And she was quite busy, of course, with both children and other things she was doing. And so she was just needed to run down the corner to the grocery store to get something because she forgot one thing. And so she began, to, uh, she thought, well, I'll hurry down there. Hurry, said, oh, to the 12-year-old girl, the 13-year-old girl, just watch the baby here and, and I'll shoot down. I'll be right back. And so it was nothing unusual. And so she ran out to the car. When she got out to the car, you know, oh, she forgot her keys. So she ran back in the house to get her keys. When she did, she left the door open a little bit. She ran back, got into the car, hurry, of course, trying to get, get done for all the things she was doing. She put the car in reverse. She stepped on it. She felt a thud immediately and heard a scream. And she realized that she had run over her little year and a half old child. Now, I tell you, she was in a panic. She picked that child up. She rushed that child right down to the hospital. And that child was nip and tuck between life and death for over two weeks. And finally, that child pulled through. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think that mother could ever get in her car and put it in reverse without thoroughly checking behind her again? No. That's what it means to repent. Repent means you are sorry for what you do, did. You will, turn your, you will ask God to help you turn your life around. You won't do these things anymore. That's what it means to repent. And finally, we must decide. 1 John 5, 12, and 13, it says, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things I have written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. When you accept Jesus Christ, when you believe in Jesus, when you've confessed your sins, you have the gift of eternal life. Receiving Jesus, we receive the gift of eternal life. From the book of Desire of Ages again, the, for Christ's sake, the Lord pardons those who fear Him. He does not see in them the vileness of the sinner. He recognizes in them the likeness of his son in whom they believe. When we accept Jesus Christ by faith, when God looks at us, he sees Jesus. Amen? What a deal. This is unbelievable. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. 
Here's what the Bible says, Proverbs 28, 13. He who conceals his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them find mercy. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities. I will what? Remember no more. One of these days, my friends, God's going to reboot the computer. All these sins will be forgotten about. They'll be done away with. It's a time. This Bible tells us this in 2 Corinthians 6, 2. Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You know, I found that the devil has two clocks. Two clocks. For the young person, the devil says, you got plenty of time. Did you hear this? You got plenty of time. In other words, live it up. Do whatever you want. Don't follow what God wants you to do. You got plenty of time. For the old person, there's a second clock. It's too late for you. You've done too much. God can't forgive you. You can never have that gift of eternal life. But my friends, God only has one clock, and that's now. Now is the day of salvation. Amen? Don't put off your decision while you're young, whether you're old. Jesus was out on a missionary journey one day, came to a well. He hadn't had anything to drink, and this lady came out uh, from the town, from a woman of Samaria. He didn't have anything to drink. His disciples went into town to get some food. And Jesus spoke to this lady, and the Jews and the Samaritans didn't have anything to do with each other. Jesus said, could you give me a drink? And the lady looked at him and said, well, how can you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan? Because you know, the Jews and Samaritans, we don't have anything to do with each other. And Jesus looked at her and said, if you knew who was talking to you, you'd ask me for a drink. And the water I give you, you'll never get thirsty again. Jesus, and she said to him, give me some of that water. And Jesus said, well, go get your husband. And, she, and the woman says, well, I've had, she says, I don't have a husband. He, Jesus said, you're right. You had five husbands. The one you're living with now is not your husband. So there is no new thing under the sun. Amen? Amen. And, then she, and this woman was real. Right then, she was converted. She went back to her village. She said, come and see a man who told me everything that's ever happened to me. And my friends... Jesus offered her the gift of his salvation. He offered the gift of the water of life. Revelation 22, 17 says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. Let him who hears say, Come. And whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take of the gift of the water of life. My friends, if you do not have eternal life, if you are not right with Jesus, do not leave this place tonight before you're right with Jesus. Amen? Amen? Ask Jesus to forgive your sins. Ask Jesus to come into your heart. Ask Jesus to take over your life and thank God for the gift of eternal life. My friends, Jesus wants you to have eternal life. You can live forever. He gave his life so that you could have eternal life. Revelation 3.20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Your mom can't open it for you. Your dad can't open it for you. Your children can't open it for you. Your wife, your husband, your relatives can't open it for, for you. Your neighbors can't open it for you. Only you can open that door. That's the door into your heart and your life. Amen. How many of you want to say tonight, I want Jesus in my heart and in my life 100%. Is that your desire tonight? Raise your hands up with me. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven tonight, we thank you that you have given us the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. We're thankful for these hands that have been lifted up tonight. We've raised our hands, Lord, because we want you in every aspect of our life, every, every day and every way. Lord, help us as we continue to study the Bible that we may learn about Jesus and his great plan of salvation and the things he has planned for us in the near future. Bless us each one, Lord, that when that day comes, when Jesus comes back to this earth, we'll look up into heaven and say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.